Do you love spy books, movies, and TV? Then the Spybrary podcast is for you. Since 2017, host Shane Whaley and Spybrary field agents around the world dispatch reviews and interviews with authors, historians, and fellow spy fans. We discuss everything from John le Carre, Len Dayton, Paul Vidich, Graham Greene, Mick Heron, Charles Cumming, Ben McIntyre, and many more. Spybrary is available on all good podcast apps and at spybrary.com. And welcome to episode 208 of the Spybury podcast. Today, we kickstart Dead Drop 5 series. Uh, Today, we're joined by author Stephen England. Welcome to Spybury, sir. Thank you, Shane. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, for those who don't know, uh, Stephen is going undercover. He's going behind the curtain. He's going to be embedded in East Berlin. And before we send him off on his mission, his clandestine mission, We've given him uh, permission to take five books with him and a couple of other fun items that we'll we'll get to later in the show. Um, so I'm very, very interested to hear what Stephen's going to request to take with him. I've got his book here, Wild Card. And Stephen is the author of the best-selling Shadow Warriors series, very active in our online community at Spybury, which I recommend everyone join, which is spybury.com forward slash community. So he's written... Fair few spy books in his time, so I'm um, really interested to find out what your first pick is, Stephen. What's the first book that you want your handler to drop off for you in the dead drop at Friedrichshain Park in East Berlin? So nar- narrowing it down to just five, Shane. I mean that that's just that's just brutal. I mean I, th- I honestly think I need a better handler. Need need someone that's a little more a little more lenient uh, with me. But uh, but yeah, the first uh, the first one uh, I think I'm going to go with is uh, the second novel in uh, Greg Rucka's uh, Queen and Country trilogy, Private Wars. I uh, it, it took me a little while to get around to uh, to reading uh, Queen and Country, and I mean the 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 TBR list is endless. But once I got into that series, I was like, man, this is good. Uh, I really. I mean the entire the entire series is good. Private Wars, I think, is my favorite book. I just I love the Central Asian setting, uh, all the geopolitics of Uzbekistan, the former Soviet republics. It's just it's a really it's an underutilized uh, setting, I think, for uh, for spy books. And Rucka just goes to town with it with uh, with that novel. And then Terra Chase is great, and and all the books. Uh, but that that book, I really I, I love that book. There's uh, and Ruck, Ruckus prose is really good. There's one uh, there's one line uh, I particularly liked seeing the, toward the middle of the book after Chase uh, picks up Rosalind and his son, and uh, Rucka writes uh, the the blood on her hands and arms had dried, and every so often a flake would come loose, caught in the wind sending it spiraling in one random direction or another, a red snowflake that flipped through the car. I don't know, that that, that line just stuck out to me. I'm like, man, that's good. <laughs> How important is good prose to you in, in a spy novel? Well, it's, it's interesting. I was actually commenting in another book group today because someone had asked kind of what makes a good action thriller, is it, or what, what separates the great action thrillers from the just kind of bleh books. And... There was a lot of discussion of characterization, plot, uh, great action period. And the one option that people hadn't really put in, it was kind of like a poll in this group. And the one action, the one uh, choice they hadn't put in there was prose. And I commented today, I was like, really, I mean, when I think of the people that really stand out to me, I mean, even, even some of what really stands out to me about Ian Fleming is just really well-written prose, will, really good turn of phrase, snappy dialogue. I mean, at the end of the day, books are a prose medium. You can do whatever you want, but unless you can actually not only have something to say, but actually manage to convey it in a way that's engaging for the reader, why read your stuff and not somebody else's? I mean, there's only so there's yeah. much time, <laughs> no matter how much we yeah. delude ourselves otherwise. But, yeah, and you... you... I mean, in your writing, you did a ton of research, right, on the Middle East, and right. on yeah. Islam, and counter espionage. Yeah. Um. So you've got that knowledge, but then it's like, okay, I guess as an author, it's you want to transport 
the reader to places that they're not familiar with. Exactly. Or yeah. Ideology or customs they're not familiar yeah. with, and and it's it's how you, I guess you know that's what I like in in a, in a spy novel is you know where they transport me to another time in history or yeah. or another destination, and you really feel. Like you're in that yeah. city or that yeah. region at that time. Yeah. And, be, and not an easy thing to do. No. And being able to bring that to life uh, for the reader is just, it's the magical experience that makes reading books worthwhile. I mean, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, and your well written prose is just critical to that because you, you it just brings the scene alive. It, it, it sometimes makes you grin at a particularly clever turn of phrase or something you weren't expecting. It's just, it's, it's gold. <laughs> yeah. So. And in terms of Private Wars, so you're saying it was the second in the series, yes. is that correct? Yeah. Do you advise our listeners to start with the first one, or can they jump straight into Private Wars? Mm, it's been a couple of years since I read the book. I would I would say it's probably possible to start with Private Wars, but they're all good, so why not why not read them in the order they were written? So. <laughs> Well, yeah. you've done it already, right? On your first book choice, to my shame, I haven't read any oh, Greg Rucker, man. so, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yep. the old credit card is quivering yeah. here. <laughs> yep, it's shaking in fear. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, what would be your uh, your second choice? Well, this one will come as no surprise to, uh, to anyone who's interacted with me on Spyberry or may have listened to a brush pass I did a couple years ago, but it's uh, Simon Conway's The Agent Runner. Yeah, and that is a, kind of a, a nice segue from our comment about well-written prose because Conway is masterful. There is, I mean, from from his very first uh, spy-oriented novel with Rage, I mean, he just he has a talent for capturing the the utter madness of the spy business, and he he doesn't bother trying to make sense of it. He illustrates all the crazy ways in which it doesn't make sense and makes it the type of book you just can't put down. And the, the Age of Runner was my introduction to his uh, to his writing, and still I think my favorite. Although Rage was very good, uh, but the Age of Runner is just it's it's just kind of that next level of uh, of madness. One of the the guy the the reader of mine who introduced me to Conway uh, basically told me his 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 elevator pitch to me of th this is why this should jump past all the other books on your TBR list was it's it's Rudyard Kipling meets Cormac McCarthy. Wow, <laughs> high praise indeed. And and I I have to say it definitely lived up to that. I mean it's it's the Agent Runner is just uh, an incredible story and. From the the literally the dirtiest dirty bomb that's ever been written into any kind of book, uh, and re readers will have to read the Agent Runner and figure out what I mean by that. But <laughs> yes, oh, <laughs> uh, to to uh, one of the one of the things that, like I said, just well written prose and stuff that just cracks you up. Uh, I don't know if I ever meet Simon Conway. I've got to ask him this question, but I really want to know because because the. Noman Butt in uh, in the Agent Runner, one of the, I think calling him an antagonist might be a little bit harsh, uh, but one of the primary characters in the book, uh, opposite uh, his protagonist Edward Malick, is uh, no Noman is a is a perfectly good uh, Pakistani name. I had to I had to look it up because I honestly was a little bit uh, thrown when I first encountered it and how he used it. But it's a perfectly leg legitimate uh, Pakistani name, Urdu, I think. Uh, but there's this great line in the book when the character introduces himself and he says, I am no man. And it's, yeah, I'm like, okay, we're, we're getting this flashback to Homer's Odyssey here. And I, I really want to ask Conway, did you choose that name just to do that, that line? Because that was an epic line. <laughs> uh, well, he's... He's an avid listener of the show, and as you know, he's in our online community, yes, so yes. I'm sure he will respond to you. And if not, actually, <laughs> uh, June 14th, he is being interviewed by Mick Heron oh, nice. at Waterstones Trafalgar Square in London, so we're hoping to go. And, and listeners, if you're planning on going, nice. there'll be quite a few Spibarians going, and there will be uh, 
adult beverages later on, I am sure. So if he doesn't answer it before then, I'll, I'll make sure I, I ask that very, question on your very, behalf, Stephen. Very, if... very nice. And sp- speaking of uh, speaking of Trafalgar Square, the, one of my favorite lines from the agent runner, he, he writes that, uh, speaking of London, uh, sometimes it felt like the whole city was a mausoleum. Its open space is punctuated by monuments to public sacrifice. <laughs> yeah, lovely, uh, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's just one of those... It's one of those lines that it could be in the book or it could not be in the book as far as the plot's concerned, but in terms of really conveying really conveying his perspective on things and his character's perspective uh-huh. on things, it's invaluable. Uh, he really, whether it's with Jonah, who I don't think he's ever named a character more appropriately than Jonah in, uh, in Rage and uh, A Loyal Spy, uh, or whether... Uh, whether uh, whether it's Edward Malick in The Agent Runner, he really captures that uh, kind of child of British colonialism character so well in a way that I've really not seen, particularly in this genre, I've really not seen uh, too many others do or do certainly not do better. Uh, but he, he, he very much captures that kind of uh, outsider-insider hybrid and... Uh, the sense of really dark cynicism as pertains to British foreign policy and the the legacy of it. So, yeah, yeah it's a brilliant book. It's <laughs> it's it's interesting because Simon works for Halo, which is the charity that clears landmines right. across the world. So every time I see him on Instagram, like for, at time of recording, he's in the Solomon Islands, mm, and yeah. and I and I wonder how that contributes to his writing because he's out there in the field. Yeah. You know, he's in the Middle East. Yeah. He spent a lot of time in Afghanistan, from what I gather, both his time in the military and also with Halo. And you know, he's seen some pretty cruel things. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, and I, I think that helps him as a writer. Like, don't get me wrong; I'm sure he'd love a multi-million dollar contract <laughs> to stay at home in Scotland and, and write all yeah. day long. But I think that helps with his writing. Yeah, there, there's definitely the there's there's thing. definitely a sense of uh, perspective there that I don't think you'd have without that experience. It's uh, yeah, it's really really golden and i should have asked this with private wars maybe we can go back to it so if we look at the spy literature genre so on the one side you've got the cerebral realistic kind of john le Carre and on the opposite to that maybe mark greedy brad thor etc which you know, jason king calls Kalashnikov kids <laughs> so on that spectrum where would you put both private wars and the agent runner hmm that's interesting oh uh, i would say it's interesting because they're both uh, they're both very much modern uh, war on terror novels, and yet uh, and yet very much in a different vein than a lot of uh, a lot of the American output in uh, the post nine eleven era. I would definitely say I would say that probably Queen and Country is a bit more action oriented than Conway. They both have action in them, but I would yeah. I would say that uh, Ruckus' writing is probably a little more about the action than Conway's is. Oh, uh, and yet at the same time, I mean, I I I enjoy a broad range. A lot of people would uh, would identify me as a Kalashnikov kid myself, so uh, I, I can't uh, I can't say that I identify very strongly with one uh, one end of that spectrum versus the other. But uh, enjoy entertaining writing all the, all the way around. So. <laughs> but yeah. on on that note, yeah. on that note of your personal reading, something I I always enjoy asking guests and and, and other listeners of Spybury is, what books got you into reading? So when you were a kid or a teenager, what was it that hooked you into reading? Was it a book? Or was it a series? Oh, you, you well, well, I, well, that's a good question. It wasn't really this genre that hooked me into reading. I I read voraciously as a kid. I read a lot of read a lot of uh, old. Uh, Juvenile fiction from the late 1800s, actually, as a kid. Uh, G. A. G. A. Wow. Henty was a big reader, a big uh, s- source of uh, entertainment for me as a kid, with a lot of his uh, histories of the British Empire and so forth, always managing to find some way to uh, inject a dashing young British gentleman into the midst of just about everything. <laughs> uh, I knew you'd give me a, a different answer that <laughs> most people say... The Hardy Boys, uh, the Saint, well, Three Investigators, Har- Har- Hardy um, Bo- Biggles. Hardy Boys was a big one yeah. too, but yeah, Gia, H- Gia yeah. Henty. I I was I grew up with a tremendous love of history, and so uh, Gia Henty was uh, fed that pretty uh, pretty uh, well for, 
for that age. Oh, uh, excellent! In, in my teens, it what really got me into this genre. And you'll you'll love this. Uh, you'll love this answer, Shane. Uh, I love Tom Tom Clancy. I had a really right. I, I had a really hard time not putting his books on this list, but wow. uh, but yeah, Tom Clancy was a huge uh, a huge uh, motivator for me towards the spy genre with uh, with Hunt for an October, w- which I would say in some ways is more of a intelligence book than a spy book. Yes, uh, I kind of I find that I find that divide interesting as well because you have some books that kind of focus on the intelligence product more than the actual mechanics of how it's produced and some people consider those spy books other people don't i i find them both interesting in their own way oh i think cardinal of the kremlin would probably be my the closest uh, clancy really came to a a spy thriller oh truly that's another another of my favorites but yeah yeah so I have that on Kindle. I'm yet to get to it, and it's 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 one that I am going to read because I did read Red October, and I agree with you that that didn't feel Kalashnikov kit to <laughs> me <laughs> at all. No, no, you no, know from no. what I was expecting. Yeah, yeah. So let's move on to your third pick. What's the third book you want to take with you behind the curtain? So, so that one, uh, I think, uh, I'm pretty sure you have read uh, James Stegskull and Appointment in Tehran. I, Do you know I have not read that oh, one? I read his okay. first one, yes, and I've got it next door. But I'm sorry, James, I haven't got to it yet. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, we have to put you on the spot there. We can edit that part out. <laughs> no, 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 it's good. No, no, I can't uh, get to all these books. Yeah. I just, I mean, I wish I was a multimillionaire and I could sit here and read all day and drink good scotch. But sadly, there's a day job. <laughs> the curse of us all, yes. Are you on the hunt for your next thrilling spy read? Look no further. Spybury contributor and Sunday Times chief political commentator Tim Shipman has curated a list of his top 125 spy authors ranked. With Tim's vast experience and expertise in politics and spy thrillers, you can trust his judgment on the best spy authors of all time. This list includes both classic and modern writers, making it the ultimate guide for any spy fan. But wait, there's more. Tim also recommends which book to try first from each author, and he shares his favorite book from each of them too, so you can dive right into the best of the best. Ready to get your hands on Tim's list? Head over to spybury.com forward slash top125 to grab your free copy now. Don't miss out on the ultimate spy reading list. Visit spybury.com forward slash top125 today. Uh, but yes, Appointment in Tehran, uh, I, I read I read James's first book and really enjoyed it. There was something very, uh, very fun about reading a Cold War book that was it's kind of... I won't say from the Kalashnikov kid ba- backdrop, really, but obviously James is a form is former special forces, and so it kind of had this unusual feeling of being a Cold War era special forces procedural, <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. and I I love that. Appointment in Tehran yeah. is leaps and bounds better than the first book. Okay, and I. It, it's set during the Iranian hostage crisis of 1979 and features a mission that is undertaken by a unit of Special Forces Berlin, which, to, to, to use the cut, the title of his nonfiction book, they go into Iran to, uh, to secure uh, something that should not be there. And I really can't tell you the last time I read a book that had me as genuinely uh, puzzled is not the right word, maybe bemused would be better, wondering how much of this actually happened. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because he inserts the story into the broader hostage crisis, and yet I do know historically there were there there was involvement by his unit in that and so i read the whole thing just like 
where is the line here? I don't know where the line is. I know where it should be from the histories I've read, but James lived this. I don't know. Yeah. He's not, he's, yeah. he's not writing it from federal prison, so I assume there's some things he's making up and not uh, not just uh, releasing for the first time, as it were. But still, it just it was a really good novel, really well written, and uh, like I say, even a lot better than his first book, which was which I greatly enjoyed. Uh, but what was better about it, Stephen, than the first? I really, I really felt like I identified more with the characters in the second book. Uh, I felt like they, I felt like his drawing of them was was a lot better. And I don't know. I think, I think, uh, whereas the first book really gripped me from kind of the special forces procedural angle, the the second book really did get to me. Like, what is real here? <laughs> and that just really grabbed me and uh, hooked me in a way that the first book just by virtue of its subject matter, hadn't uh, hadn't quite gotten to me that as as strongly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's that's where I actually have a Spyberry, Spyberry exclusive to share, is that uh, I'm currently reading an ARC from uh, from James of his uh, right. upcoming novel, Dead Hand, which uh, I think anyone who read the first three and enjoyed them will uh, will enjoy this one too, from what I've read of it so far, so... Brilliant. Much more to come um, from him, I, I trust. Yeah, I just read that he's uh, got a new publisher. Is it Double Dagger? I believe so, yes. Yeah. And, the, yeah. and this book is with so, him. So, yeah. 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 Um, we'll have to get him on. To, well, I, I'm due to meet him. Um, he's uh, in Vermont, actually. Nice. Doing something with... Uh, an, oh, look, like, I'm not a car guy. It was not an Aston Martin, his, but it was some kind of his, car he's restoring. His, yeah, I have... I saw that uh, car by virtue of the Facebook gods choosing to show it to me randomly in my newsfeed from a car group. He had posted pictures of it in. Oh, wow. That is unreal. See, definitely, yeah. definitely meet James, but also see the car if you can't. <laughs> yes, I'd like to. I'd like to uh, very much. And where do you where do you put his on this, you know, this map of the spy genre? Where man, would you put Appointment in Tehran? I would say it's very much still largely due to his background and his insider knowledge i'd say it's still very much kind of a uh deeply grounded uh, there's there's probably a bit more action in appointment in tehran than there was in uh, his first book what was that a question mm. that i think was the title in his first yes uh there's probably a bit more action but like i say his 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 knowledge of how it's actually done really roots the book, yeah. and uh, yeah. it it prevents it from ever developing too much in the way of flights of fancy. So I I love his nonfiction stuff. Oh yeah, so, I mean I, yeah. I read that before I'd, I'd even got to to chat with James and and I you know with my special interest in Cold War Berlin. I Likewise, mean, it's just, yeah, you know, just mind yeah, blowing. Yeah, that, that was that was my introduction <laughs> to him as well. I listened to I I used to listen to podcasts a lot more than I do these days, and. Uh, I had picked up his, I think, uh, International Spy Museum, SpyCast interview about yes. Special Forces Berlin, and I was listening to it just like, how have I never heard this history before? This is this is unreal. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Good. Well, I, I mean, it's always good when you recommend a fellow spy barrier. James is active in our community yes, as well. Yes, idiot. Um, in your Dead Drop 5. So what would your fourth pick? So my fourth pick be? is uh, one that's actually fairly recent for me. Uh, after having been given the book uh, years ago and been and been told actually by a friend of mine who uh, works for the CIA that it was the best book he had ever read on China, best spy novel he had ever read on China, and that is Adam Brooks' Night Heron. Yes. That is uh, truly an incredible book. I... I think as well as what we were talking about earlier with uh, with prose and and this the, the really you were talking about it uh, a book tr kind of transporting you to places you've never been and really doing so with a sense of authenticity and Adam Brooks really nails that with Nine Heron and his portrayal of what it would be like to c conduct espionage behind uh, in in one of the most uh, denied spaces in the world really and uh, yeah. and it does so with uh, with a lot of uh, a lot of realism, a lot of conviction, and and characters that you just you, you really want to root for, uh, you really want to root for Peanut, uh, the the Chinese dissident who's spent the last I forget twenty twenty five years or so in a labor camp, and now he's out and he's learning the entire new world that is cell phones and the internet and 
everything else and not really knowing how to manage with with all the developments and yet trying to get back in the game and it's just it's tremendously compelling i i love love the book oh yeah he he is a lot of fans of spyro in fact um our uh, co-host Jeff Quest actually interviewed him on Spybury nice. not so long back nice. for Spybury, and that had a huge amount of downloads showing him that the popularity yeah. is still there. People yeah. are still hungry, but they're hungry for more <laughs> from him. Yeah, I need to read. It's been recent enough that I read Night Heron, finally read Night Heron, that I haven't gotten to the final two books of the trilogy, but I, I've heard great things and really need to dive into those as well in the near future. So, I, so yeah. Full disclosure, I haven't read it yet. I, I have oh, it on the bookshelf because okay. it was one that was recommended yeah, early yeah. on in my read, yeah. and it's like, okay, let's get it, but uh, not got to that one yet. I, ironically, I was actually given it in, a, in practically a, a literal literal dead drop. I met a reader of mine in New York City that was, they were coming in to the U.S. from overseas, and they wanted to meet up, and I'm like, sure, let's let's go do it. And I went to, actually, uh, Phyllis Barberi and Matt Fulton and I both went and met him, and he gives me this bag, and then it's the copy of the Night Heron. So I mean, kind of, kind of my own brush pass, uh, dead drop delivery of a spy novel. <laughs> Fantastic! Uh, yeah, and that was in New York City. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Um, how do you feel then, as an author yourself? Because some people say to me, "Hey, she, you know, why don't you write a book?" And I'm like, <laughs> "Well, first of all, I'm not particularly a great writer. Secondly," There's just too many great books out there to read that <laughs> I want to read. And I often wonder, you know, as an author, do you sometimes pick up a book and think, oh, why bother? Like, I'm not going to touch this. Or does it inspire you to think, no, I can create something like this <laughs> as engaging a read as this? I, I always wonder that with authors. Yeah, I mean, I think I think there's definitely, there's definitely books I read that uh, I, I say to myself, man, I wish I had written this. Or... <laughs> Or I wish I could write like this. Uh, th there's definitely there's definitely some uh, there's definitely some people that uh, absolutely intimidate me when I'm reading them. But I mean, you you, you do what you can to bring your own unique uh, perspective to things, and you just roll forward and uh, try to learn from the best. So. <laughs> well, I yeah. I do I do like you know in your writing you know in the first chapter of. Um, the book I showed earlier, Wild Cut. There was one line in it where the guy is in in the gym and someone says, "Oh, you look like you used to lift, bro." <laughs> <laughs> and he's gonna thinking about knocking him into next week. Yeah, decide yeah. To, but it's just like that, you know, that bit of humor is yeah. in there that yeah. you know I, I think is important. So I, I I like that about your writing as yeah. well. well it's thank, not all just thank you. Yeah, I mean, I I, I, th I think it's I think it's uh, I think it's one thing one of those things where. I like portraying espionage as a very serious business, and yet, like someone like Simon Conway nails it so well. There's there's places where it is serious, and yet it's so the human element creates situations that are so farcical that you can't do anything but just roll with it and embrace the dark humor of it. Oh, uh, yeah. So yeah, I, I enjoy I enjoy doing a bit of that in, in my writing where where it appear where it appears appropriate. So. <laughs> Perfect. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. No. Let's move on to your your fifth book in your selection. Yes. Yeah, so uh, so this is a, this is another uh, another librarian, uh, Matt Crucio, who uh, wrote uh, his debut novel Security Day a couple years ago, and. Security Day was one I think I actually first encountered it through a Facebook ad, uh, and then later ran into Matt on Spybury, and I didn't I didn't know what to expect from it at all. It's a debut novel. didn't 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 really know uh, didn't really know what I was getting into, but it blew me away and became one of my top books of I think that was 2021. I read it. Uh, became one of my top books of 2021 because. Much like we were talking earlier with uh, Simon Conway and the the perspective and experience that his uh, his time in the field, as it were, has given his writing. Uh, Crucio is a former uh, Navy interrogator who spent time in Afghanistan, and right. Security Day is it's really a beautifully drawn portrait of intelligence work in a war zone, which. I think I think a lot of we don't see a ton of that in in really a realistic exploration. Of course, there's been a lot of 
action thrillers written in war zones, but really a more serious meditation on what it'd be like to run agents in that type of situation. We don't see a lot of that, and you do in Security yeah. Day. And uh, really, he he brings a lot of uh, he brings a lot of nuances of Afghanistan to the book in trying to really portray things from both sides, from both the perspective of the American handler and also the young Afghan who's been recruited to spy on the Taliban. And it's it's it really took me took me back and just how how grounded and how authentic its portrayal is with everything I learned from talking to people there over uh-huh. the years and, and everything, and just very much the sense of survivalism, as it were. There is a great line, uh, there's a great line in the book where uh, the, the American agent is talking with this young Afghan, and he's talking to him about this, uh, this it, it, his extended family, which in Afghanistan is cousins and second cousins and third cousins and so forth. And he's talking to him about his extended family and talking to him about this uh, uncle or what, whoever it is who's a very high-ranking Taliban commander. And in the course of the conversation, the American intelligence agent officer finds out that uh, that guy's brother is a fairly high-ranking Afghan police colonel. And it just blows his mind. And he, he asks the young Afghan, he says, well, he he says, uh, how, asks him how the Taliban commander would feel about that. And the young Afghan just kind of looks at him. He's like, he's fine with it. Our, our family decided that one strong son would go with the Talibs and another strong son with the government so that either way we would be on the side that wins. <laughs> and it's, it's just, and, and yet it's it's not portrayed in the book harshly with a sense of, Look at look at these people who can't be trusted and are playing both sides. It's really shown with the sympathy of these people know. I mean, it's it's what a friend of mine years ago we were talking about Afghanistan, Iraq, the insurgencies there, and talking about the the reality, of the difficulty of a great power that sees this one country as just this one square on the chessboard. Well, that's fine for you, but for the person you're fighting, that's the enti- that country's the entire chessboard. And Chris yeah. Shear really nails the sympathy of dealing with people who who know if they do pick the wrong side, they're getting wiped out. They, everyone they care about, they're all dead. Yeah. And so in the context of that, he takes a line that could, in another book, very much be a, just a duplicitous laugh line. And it re- he really makes it resonate with the power of these people have everything on the line and the consequences are beyond fathoming for most of us if they pick wrong. So in that type of situation, why not pick both sides and make sure you're not going to lose everything? <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. So, so yeah, that's, that's a really, I, I would say really, it's probably probably one of the best war on terror spy novels I've read in terms of just really digging into the conflict and making you sympathize with the people who find themselves swept up in it. It's, it's really, really well done. And I trust we'll see a lot more from Crucio. I've not, uh, I don't know what he's working on at the moment, but I hope it's something, something further. So. (laughs) Absolutely. Well, you know, being featured, being recommended on dead drop five, I'm sure the, uh, the book sales will, uh, skyrocket Definitely. for him and there'll be pressure for him to get a second one out Definitely. for his fans um and it's actually interesting looking at the five uh, you recommended it and i had a feeling this would happen i'm really <laughs> pleased about it out of the five i've only read one nice. of the yep. five so you've given me some homework <laughs> here yep and i've hurt your credit card so i mean there there we go <laughs> well luckily i already have two of them uh, okay. but they're just living on the shelf yeah. they're in that you know yep books that I look at and think I need to really need to get yeah. to those. Yeah, that's where Nine Heron was for years. So <laughs> I, I sympathize. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Uh, so I've got a couple of questions for you before we send you off to, to Berlin. Yeah. Uh, and unlike the, the Dead Drop Fives, we I feel a bit sorry for you because um, <laughs> we haven't prepped you for this. So uh, <laughs> bear with us on this because future guests will listen to this and go, they'll, they'll prepare in advance. But 
There's a few other things where we want to okay. send with you. Sounds good. Uh, so, what would be one piece of music? So that could be an album, yeah. a CD, a, a song that you know would really you would uh, enjoy listening to when you're undercover. Mm. Yeah, I I think uh, I think I'm probably gonna have to go. I'm trying to remember the name of the album now. Uh, but uh, I'm I'm a huge fan of Ella Fitzgerald. Uh-huh. And I think I would have to, like I say, I can't remember the album, but I'm going to go with the with the one I, ha- I have the recording of where she sings the song that I actually uh, performed uh, somewhat impromptu at uh, my wedding reception. Uh, it's called I Didn't Know What Time It Was, and that's, uh, that's a big favorite of mine. So, yeah, we, we'll go with that one. So I will add that onto our show notes so we can all go take nice. a listen to yeah. that for those of us who aren't it's a, familiar it's a with beautiful it, the song. show notes. Brilliant. Um, show notes for today's episode can be found at spybury.com forward slash 208. So what about a bottle of booze? What are you taking with you? Anything you want, we'll get it for you. <laughs> what, well, what would you like? Well, I don't drink myself, so uh, I, I wouldn't be, wouldn't be taking it for my own consumption. I do, I do think it would probably make pretty good hard, uh, hard currency, uh, the other, the other side of the wall though. So, uh. Maybe, maybe, maybe a bottle of Lagavulin. and maybe a bribe, bribe, bribe a few uh, East German officers with that. <laughs> Without a doubt. Are you a soda drinker? I am. Yes. Do you want? Do you want to take a favorite bottle of soda with you? Oh, uh, yeah, that's probably, uh, probably, and because East Berlin cola is terrible. Ah, uh, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> East German cola, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, pr- probably take some N.W. Root beer with me then. <laughs> ah, good shout. I'm a huge fan of root beer yep, myself. Yep. So <laughs> excellent. Um what about a luxury item? Ah, uh, the this this one I think I don't know how much of a luxury item it is, but it it comes to it comes to my mind and uh it's uh, probably suitably controversial. I'm I'm a huge fan of Turkish Delight. So I th- I think I'll take a nice box of Turkish Delight with me. Fantastic. <laughs> can you get that in the US? We can, by we the can way? yes. Yeah. Right, you're gonna have to tell me where your uh, your supplier is because I normally bring. It's the same in this Amazon. house. We're all big fans of it. Amazon, they deliver. <laughs> oh wow! So there's me ferrying it back from the UK. <laughs> I'm surprised customs haven't pulled me in with all these bars of Turkish delight. <laughs> but we, we especially enjoy them at Christmas. Nice. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Now that that's not what I was expecting. So that's uh, <laughs> that's a good one. Um, what about? Let's say, and we hope this doesn't happen, but you send out the Mayday distress uh, signal. Which spy do you want us to send it to get you out, to extract you from East Berlin? Well, I very much hope that doesn't happen. Uh, I think I am going to go back to my Clancy roots and say that I'd like John Clark to come get me. Uh, I think come get you. Yeah, I, th- I think I can count on him. I I thought I thought of a few. All I would think of a few others, but I mean, some some of the spies. Uh, some of the spies in the genre, uh, bad things happen to the people around them. And I, I, re- I really <laughs> think I would not want to be that person. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with John yeah. Clark. Good guy, and I think I could count on him to uh, pull, my, uh, pull me out of the frying pan. <laughs> Got it. So, let's say you have sent the district distress signal. He's there at the door. Steve, quick, we got to go. What about all my books? You can take one. Which one of these five would you take with you? I'm probably going to just say leave me. <laughs> <laughs> the mark of a truce, my variant. I'm not leaving my books. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah I, I don't know. I'd probably, if, if I had to pick, uh, yeah, I'd probably, I'm probably going with Conway and the Agent Runner. Probably, probably taking that one. Nice. <laughs> nice. And finally, who would you like to hear next on Dead Drop Five on Spybury? I'd I'd have to go with uh, with my good friend and colleague Matt Fult. I think he would, uh, I think he would make for a very entertaining uh, Dead Drop Five. So excellent, yeah. good <laughs> suggestion. <laughs> and it's been a long time since Matt was on Spybury. I think we actually, gosh, I don't know, it was before COVID anyway. Yeah. So in, in the before times. dark and distant, <laughs> yeah, in the before times, and I and I, I want to remember what we were talking. I'll have to, I'll have to, I'll put it in the show notes anyway. Which um, which book we were talking about? I think it was a panel that he was on. But yeah, good choice, um, Stephen. Thanks very much for giving us some of your time today. I know you're busy writing books and traveling around the country, and uh, well, 
you know, we appreciate you coming on and sharing your five uh, Dead Drop 5 books for us. Well, thanks so much for having me, Shane. It's been a pleasure. For our listeners who want to try your work, find out more about you, where can we send them? Uh, send them to my uh, actually new website, uh, stephenenglandbooks.com. stephenenglandbooks.com. And we'll also add that into the awesome. show notes, spybury.com forward slash 208. And, uh, you know, come join our community and, and have a chat with Stephen about his dead drop fives. Agree? Disagree? <laughs> what do you think of his picks? Uh, that's what the community's there for. It's uh, There's almost 3,000 of us in there that are sharing book recommendations every day and, you know, have good banter as well. Yep. Um, Stephen, thanks a million for coming Thank on, you, sir. Thank you, Thanks for listening to the Spybrary Podcast. You don't have to wait for the next episode. Join the conversation happening now at facebook.com slash spybrary and on Twitter at spybrary.